Luke chapter 23, let's begin in verse 35. And the people stood looking on, even the rulers, uh, and with them sneered, saying, If he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray together. Lord, we just we thank you for your revelation, Lord. We recognize that revelation is a privilege, Lord. We want to uh, appropriate your revelation uh, in a way that would be fitting, which is uh, being ready to obey it by your grace and by your power, Lord. So we pray that you would work among us. Uh, we pray that you would rest upon us by your Holy Spirit. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. We're not interested in merely going through religious activity or going through the motions. We're interested in engaging you and having you um, fashion us and convict us and exhort us and comfort us and giving us joy like you love to do. So we ask, Lord, for that great work of the Spirit. We pray that you would help us to be ready to be doers of your word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. So we yield it to you. We pray that you set this time aside for your holy use. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So last week when we looked at the first statement from the cross, uh, we first arrived at Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where they crucified people. Before this, I had mentioned that Simon of Cyrene helped the Lord Jesus carry the cross, being carried the cross. Uh, he was compelled to do it because Jesus no longer could. The Roman soldiers nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. This was their job. They likely done it hundreds, if not thousands of times. It was just their normal day at work uh, as a soldier. But this day was different. They would see that by the end of this day, by the end of their shift. Today, on this day, they were nailing the Son of God to the cross. They were na nailing God in human flesh to the cross, seeing and observing no resistance, no begging for mercy, no insults. As a lamb that was led to the slaughter was silent, so he opened not his mouth. What the soldiers heard was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the soldiers heard it, but they weren't the only ones that uh, had heard it. Everyone around Jesus heard it, which we'll get into a little bit later. John, the apostle, was there with Mary, and there was a few Marys that were there, uh, but also two very notable people heard as well. Uh, and it's rarely talked about, it's rarely studied, it's rarely um, pointed out uh, there that, that during this second statement of the cross, um, some other people heard as well, these thieves. So the title of my message this morning is Jesus' second statement on the cross. I just want to review quickly the seven statements that were made on the cross. We, we looked at the first one last week, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The second one is, Assuredly, I say to you, today will be with me in paradise. The third statement is, Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. The fourth statement is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth statement is, I thirst. The sixth statement is, It is finished. And number seven, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So today, the second statement, Father, forgive them, or excuse me, um, Second statement is uh, the the um, today you'll be with me. surely I say to you submit today you'll be with me in paradise. Now Matthew and Mark just for a little background Matthew and Mark reveal that these two criminals were thieves because of the content of what the repentant thief which we'll focus on today so what the content of what he says it is believed 
that at least his cross, possibly both of them, was positioned in a way where he could read the sign above Jesus' head. You have to think about what they knew. They weren't outside of the trial. They were inside. They were away from this. Remember, remember the religious leaders wouldn't come inside the praetorium because of the, they didn't want to be rendered ceremonially unclean. So he, Pilate came out to them, and he brought Barabbas, but likely these two thieves were not part of that. Now, we don't know what they heard or learned about the Lord Jesus before this, but it's very likely they didn't know very much at all about this other man. They just know that it, for some reason Barabbas was not going to be crucified with them, and that this other man, because they all walked to Golgotha all together, we're told in the passage that, and the other passages that, that these criminals were along with the Lord Jesus. They were there when Simon of Cyrene was compelled by the Romans, the sword that went on his shoulder and said, you are compelled to carry this cross. And so he did. He didn't understand what was happening. He didn't understand that this is his Messiah. He went to celebrate the Passover, but the Passover lamb was going to be crucified that day. So we're going to look at, take a look at these, these thieves a little bit and then um, the salvation of the repentant thief. Uh, now, it's, it, we have to remember that these thieves wouldn't be any different than the Lord Jesus in the sense that their crimes were, they had signs above their heads of their crimes. And they would have their name, their crime, including their family name, which were intended to bring shame on their family. Again, you have to understand why Rome was doing this. Rome was doing this to provide in, a, a deterrent to not challenge Rome. It was like these people that were crucified were public uh, examples of don't go against Rome. That's what their mind, so they, in their mind, they were doing it for. So they were, everything was supposed to provide maximum shame, maximum punishment as a deterrent. And so, um, you know, they have their position to where their position. Now, God could have had them both on one side of Jesus, but he chose not to, to do that in his sovereignty, he puts one on each side, uh, possibly emphasizing there are two choices, and those two choices are polar opposite of each other. They have a, I believe they have a view of the Lord Jesus, at least the repentant one done, does. And so uh, there's only two choices. There's only two choices. Either you believe or you're not going to believe. It's really simple. People get all nuanced with all their reasoning of like not receiving, and there's, and there's all this you know, uh, variations and everything. But really, uh, you, either, you either believe or you don't believe. And there's consequences for each. So Mark reveals that Jesus was between two thieves, and it actually is a fulfillment of prophecy, that it says that there, this, there might be, it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 53, 12, which says, he was numbered with the transgressors. So this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Again, I've mentioned as we've gone through the book of John, God is in control. Jesus was slain, according to Romans thir or, uh, Revelation 13, before the foundation of the world. This was God's solution. God was in control the whole time. Nothing was being done to Jesus that wasn't being allowed to be done. And he has been in control. We've gone through it as we've gone through the book of John. Everything that's happened to him, and I've highlighted on purpose for us to see that Jesus was in control the entire time. He was the one leading the circumstances. He was the one leading the conversations. He was affecting kings he was affecting uh people in power and, and and they were the one on trial as we go through as we've seen it so um so what does it mean he was numbered with the transgressors it means that he was counted as a transgressor he was numbered by the people and the romans and everyone involved this is this man's a transgressor just like these other two that was part of the shame that jesus despised that we we're told about in, in hebrews chapter 12. He, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Part of that shame was his physical vulnerability, probably naked. Uh, but he, the shame also of being considered a criminal. Even if he were just one of us, which he wasn't, to, to be falsely accused, which humans can be falsely accused, obviously. But to have God in human flesh who never sinned once be falsely ac accused, would produce a shame that is unfathomable to the human mind and the human heart there. So one of these men, the repentant thief, gets saved. One gets saved, the other doesn't. 
Both these men are the same in many ways. Both were thieves. Both were guilty. Both were crucified. Both know they're going to die that day. Jesus said today you'll be with me in paradise. And, and, and Jesus died before they did. And they, they because of the Sabbath and not wanting those bodies to be there, they broke their shins. Because the, when you're on the cross, you would push up to get, to get air. And you would have a hard time breathing. And so they would smash the shin bones so that they could no longer press themselves up. And they would usually die of asphyxiation. And that's what happened to, the, to, to the, both the two thieves. But fulfilling prophecy, Jesus' bones were not, not one bone was broken. So one saved and not saved. I mean, ones that, the ones that saved is not saved because of works. He's not saved because he got baptized. He's not saved because he went to church. He was a good person. He did religious works. He's not saved because he did the sacraments. He's not saved because some priests read the last rites to him. He's not saved because he prayed to Mary or believed in, or believed in uh, purgatory or whatever. I mean, praying to Mary would have been futile, you know. Praying, I was raised Catholic, so I can tease a little bit. But, you know, Mary full of grace. And she's down there going, I'm right here. You know, uh, this is not going to help, you know, if he, if he had done that. The, the, the point is, is that he, he, there's nothing that he did to deserve it. There's no works that he can do. He's nailed to a cross. He's, you can't do one single thing outwardly or regarding holiness. Isaiah he already had said that our righteousness is like filthy rags. He had no righteousness to offer. He was guilty. Now, we're also told in both Mark, Matthew and Mark that they both reviled and insulted him. That's missed a lot. This repentant thief actually had just been reviling earlier because they were on the cross for, for uh, six hours. Uh, and, 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 and so halfway through that at noon, it went dark, completely dark, pitch black dark. I don't know if they had torches. I don't know if they had a way to provide some light. But he heard a lot of the, the rest of the things that happened on the cross. He heard them in the dark, and he heard uh, those things. And so it's likely that they, they hurled these uh, insults and everything to him because primarily of the religious leaders, because they started it. Look at verse 35. And the people stood looking on, and even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. So this was the scribes the elders, the chief priests, probably the whole Sanhedrin came out to see this. They've been so invested emotionally, mentally, they've planned all this. Who would not go out to the, to the cross that's on the Sanhedrin? All 71 of them, the Sanhedrin plus the high priest. They would go out there and, and to see it. They're probably 72 because Annas was added to that as well. So there was kind of a quasi-high priest. There was Caiaphas and, and Annas. We went over that when we went through the book of John or with those verses in the book of John. So also we're told in verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, verse 37, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. At some point, both thieves joined in, both of them. They both hurled insults at Jesus. So not only where was this man repentant and, and he was guilty of his crimes, that were placed above him, it would be it would say above his cross what his crime was. They were thieves, but maybe they did other things. Uh, the other thief had the same thing. Obviously, Jesus <laughs> didn't need to look at those signs to know their guilt. He knew their, what their guilt was. But everybody had these signs that were being crucified, including the Lord Jesus. So he's, he was guilty of all the things he had done that got him on the cross in the first place. But he's also guilty with something infinitely worse of blaspheming the Lord Jesus while he's on the cross and insulting him and, and, and saying all of that. So that, that is the situation. And knowing the facts lets us know the depths of the grace of God that's being shown here. John tells us in John chapter 1 that Jesus is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. We need both. We definitely need both. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7 says, In the ages to come, we will be learning, of, with the, learning about the riches of his grace. We'll have new bodies. We'll, we'll already have gone through the millennium. We'll have... We'll be, go through the, we'll be in the New Jerusalem that you read in Revelation. 
but in the ages to come, way beyond that. Nail on the cross since 9 a.m. They've watched Jesus here. Now, these are the two things. These are the two influencing things for this thief. The sign of Jesus, what's up above on Jesus of his cross, and, and then also, I believe, predominantly watching Jesus go through everything that he went through. And, and also watching Jesus repeatedly say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, I said repeatedly. What's interesting is that when you look at the Greek related to verse 34, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Tense. What a heart. Those soldiers heard him say that. Heard him say that. And this thief is there, and he's thinking if he can, if he can forgive, <clears throat> repeatedly asking the Father to forgive these Romans of this, what can he do for me? Seeing that heart so powerful. Hearing Jesus repeatedly say, he, first of all, not seeing any insults, not seeing any uh, begging, not seeing just just seeing him be gracious, like in his mouth shut and just taking it, and 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 just amazing to see this heart being uh, revealed. So it's it's incredible. Everyone close by heard what Jesus was saying over and over, and the, the, thieves, the thieves saw all of this. What they saw was a sinless example of crucifixion. Jesus never sinned, even on the cross. Now, he's going to have the sin of the world. That punishment... logical word but it means satisfying payment and so it pleased the father we're told and he took the sin of the world but he personally never had sinned before and didn't sin on that cross they saw a perfect holy example of crucifixion maybe they had watched other crucifixions it's a common place they, they put those crucifixions in a place where it's highly traveled Maybe they watched other people get crucified. Maybe they've seen that over and over. They have a history of watching people suffer. And now they see someone that's totally different. And they're seeing that this man, is, his crime was he's the king of the Jews. If there were other crimes, they would have put it up there. He knows that. But he's seeing the king of the Jews. That's in part why he can say he did nothing wrong. Because there would have been other crimes up there. But also more than that, he's seeing supernatural dealing with this cross and what what's happening there so he saw this sign let's go over what he saw he saw jesus of nazareth king of the jews so he's jesus the word that word is the greek version of the hebrew uh yeshua there's a common name joshua was a common name but it means jehovah is salvation he would know that he would see Nazareth, very despised. Nathaniel criticized, said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yeah, you're, you live seven miles away in Cana. It's kind of the same place. Give me a break. How different can Nazareth be than Cana? But that's where Nathaniel was from. And then he sees, and this is the big thing, king of the Jews. And he's seeing this king, and he's looking down and seeing this crown, and he's looking back up, to see this is, a, this is a king. He's being mocked there, but he's acting like a king. 
from out of this world. He's acting like something he's never seen before. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14 tells us this, Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, visage was more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. They looked on his face and knew that he was beaten badly, even more reason to be amazed at his forgiveness being offered. This beating badly had already happened. He got to the cross like that. He got to the cross already being having his visage and his face being like that, fulfilling prophecy. So the, repent, the repentant thief had seen Jesus ask the Father forgiveness over and over. Again, thinking possibly, could it be true for me? Could it be true for me? Well, what do I have to lose? All he can say is no. All he can do is reject me. But maybe, just maybe, he'll see me and accept me. Because he has to have this concrete view that there's nothing I have to offer. So if he's going to do this for me, it's going to all be because of who he is. And I've seen who he is. I've watched him for hours at his worst place ever. And I'm just amazed at what I've seen. He had to think that. Verse 39, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, the other thief, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Or this is the, the, the repentant thief. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Verse 41, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. In essence, we belong here. This is appropriate for us. We're guilty. He is not. Not knowing, probably not knowing anything about Jesus' past, his claims to be sinless, saying, who among you convicts me of sin? There was silence then, there's silence today. Legitimate silence because no one can convict him of sin. So this man is owning his sin. That's the first step in repentance. He's accepting that I deserve this. That's the first step. You know, we live in a no-fault world. No one wants to take responsibility. No one wants to take ownership. No one wants to admit they were wrong about anything. And it's not, it's not of God. God wants us to acknowledge things. God wants us to be honest and take responsibility. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, and he shows people they're guilty. We're not called to, to convince them that they're guilty. We're called to preach the gospel, and the Holy Spirit comes and convicts the world of sin and other things. So he, he, he did this with the thieves. The Holy Spirit is convicting both thieves. I mean, the, the thieves are seeing, both thieves are seeing the same set of circumstances. And he's convicting them. One responded well, one did not. All of us, it, 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 we're in that situation before we come to know Christ. Where we can respond one way or the other. So he's seeing that this is the king of the Jews. Well, every king has a kingdom. What king doesn't have a kingdom? And he discerned that. So then we get to the, the second statement of the cross. And by the way, this, these statements are recorded statements. We know that he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do multiple times. Not the only, so he, he said more than seven things on the cross. It's the recorded things. We don't know the things that he said, you know, apart from that, and, and we're not going to guess. But the point is, is that that's why we're saying these are the seven statements of the cross. But this is what Jesus said, the second statement in our list, verse 43, and Jesus said to him, surely I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because this must have blessed Jesus. You know, if you look through the gospels and you study the gospels, you see that what blessed Jesus was faith. Faith in him, not faith in faith. That's not good, but faith in him. It blessed him. He was astonished. The only time he's astonished was unbelief and Nazareth, and he was astonished by faith. He was amazed by people's faith. I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. He's telling that to his disciples outside of the bounds of Israel, talking to, to, to people that... You know, he went outside of the bounds of Israel and he was amazed at people's faith. It blessed him. So here 
I love the fact that God was working in a way to where he would have somebody to bless him with believing, believing him. The word assuredly means that it's really literally the word amen. It means that's the truth. So when we say amen, we're saying that's the truth uh, there. And so uh, that thief would be there with Jesus in paradise that day. Why? Because he put his faith in Jesus. This thief believed in his death, burial, and resurrection. How do we know that? Because he obviously believed in his death because he's dying there. He knows he's going to be buried. And then he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's the resurrection. You know, if, we've, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10 says that we'll be saved. So that all that has to happen there. So he was saved. And what is paradise? Now, people have different views on this. I just want you to know. But the ones outside of what I'm going to say right now are wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I do believe this, and this is why, that paradise is not heaven. Um, because he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Was Jesus in heaven that day? No, he was not. He was not in heaven that day. Where was he? He was in his grave that day. He was prepared for burial. And then he was in his grave that day. Pretty sure that's not paradise. I'm pretty sure the thief wouldn't be excited about that. I'm sure it was meant to be a blessing, whatever it was, wherever paradise is, it was meant to be a blessing. So it's not a blessing to be in the tomb. Also remember that in John chapter 20, verse 17, we're told he said to Mary Magdalene, don't cling to me, for I have not ascended to my father. He hadn't even on the resurrection on Sunday, he hadn't, ascended, he hadn't been to the father after he rose from the dead. He said that. That's why he didn't want Mary Magdalene to cling to him. He hadn't gone back to the father. So where was Jesus later that day? He was in his grave there. And so there's also another piece to this. And I believe they went to Abraham's bosom. I believe they went to Hades. There's two compartments of Hades. One's Abraham's bosom. The other's called Hades there. And, and, and the Abraham's bosom is the place where all the Old Testament saints who were trusting in the future Messiah went waiting for, waiting for salvation. And so I believe that Jesus, and why I know that is in John chapter 12, verses 39 through 40, we're told this, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, in the heart of the earth. So he hadn't gone to heaven yet. Paradise can't be the grave. So, it, so if Ephesians chapter 4 said, what does it mean that he ascended except that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth? That's a cross-reference for this. Ephesians chapter 4. Peter talks about Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison. When did that happen? When he was down there. So he proclaimed himself to be the Messiah to the Old Testament saints, and he proclaimed judgment to the demonic, to the demons, that were being held there in Hades that were a result of the sins that they participated in in Genesis chapter 6. That's a whole other study. But So I believe that's where Jesus was in the spirit realm. I'm not talking about they're in the magna core uh, you know, of the earth. It's in the spirit realm. We don't know what's down there. We can't even get to even we're close to that when you study that out. So, so Jesus, I believe, is arranged for this thief to be in Abraham's bosom and then he showed up in Abraham's bosom. The thief is there. And he, this thief, because he received Christ at that moment and blessed the Lord with faith and trusted that it wasn't anything of himself but believed that Jesus could do it, he allows him to be in Abraham's bosom there to hear Jesus proclaim to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to Elijah, to Moses, I am the one you were looking for. I am the prophet that Moses spoke about. In, in, in Genesis, promise the prophet. I am the one that Isaiah prophesied about. Isaiah was there. I fulfilled his chapter 53. There were four chapters, but I fulfilled that. I fulfilled, David, what you said about uh, what it was like for me to be on the cross in Psalm 22. You know, uh, Micah, you said that I 
would be um, born in Bethlehem Ephratha in Micah 5.2. I'm the one that you talked about. Uh, you can go on and on. Isaiah, I'm the one in, that, that, that was born of the virgin you prophesied about in Isaiah 7.14. Over and over and over again. It all, it's some, Jesus was proclaiming himself to be the Messiah. And then they believed and then he emptied that out. He emptied that out. And now, now when people die... They don't, if they're a Christian, they go to heaven immediately. Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no soul sleep. There's nothing. It's just, uh, you know, you go to be with Jesus. But if you die today and you haven't received Jesus, you're not born again, you go to Hades. And in Luke, uh, or Luke chapter 16, the, the Lord Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus in this gulf and you can't cross them and everything like that. And the rich man was like, just one, if I could just go tell my, my family. And, he's, and, and, and Jesus was like, if you're not going to believe Moses and the prophets, they're not going to believe someone that raised from the dead to come back. There's that place there. And so that's where people go right now. That's where the unrepentant thief has been for 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years. In, in uh, uh, 2032 or 33, it'll be exactly 2,000 years, the anniversary of that. 2000th anniversary. Think about that. It's amazing. I don't know the day of the hour, but you know, if you're going to want it to be, you know, exactly 4000 years or 5000 years and then you're going to start the 1000 year millennium, that'd be a cool time or maybe the rapture will happen 7 years before that date so that the second coming will happen at the 5000th year of human history and then that'll set up the 1000 year millennium. I don't know. I'm not a date setter. Uh, Tony is. But, um, you know, I'm not a date setter, uh, so don't listen to him. But it's amazing God's heart from this man that's expressing his heart, expressing his, his desire to be with Jesus. And Jesus is accommodating that, you know, you or I would not be able to have the headspace at all to think about this man who deserves to be there. But we think about the people that we talk to. Do we sometimes think this person doesn't deserve what I have to say related to the gospel. Who are we to do that? We don't know the heart. The gospel's for everybody. No one's too bad. Listen, no one's too bad to be saved. And no one can be good enough to be saved. As they say, the, love, the, 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 the level of the cross, it's all level at the, at the cross. It's level ground at the cross. Everyone has equal standing. We're all guilty. If we fall short of perfection, which all of us have, we qualify because to be a sinner is to be less than perfect. And I love when unbelievers try to argue with me and try to say, well, that means you, like they got me. <laughs> okay, you got me. I'm a sinner too. See, it just shows you they don't understand. They think that we think that we're going to heaven because we're good people and we're good religious people. And we do good works. I love doing the whole shock. To me, it's shock treatment when I tell people, yeah, I don't deserve heaven at all. I have, I have no way to trust in anything in myself to go to heaven. And they're so shocked. They're like, how is that possible? Then how are you going to heaven? I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus did. He paid the price for me. I'm trusting in that alone, not my religious works, not my belief in God, not my going to church, not my whatever that you can say. None of that gets us to heaven. That's why Jesus said that if, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. What does born again mean? It means that you're born once physically. We all are. We all qualify as that. But we're born spiritually at a moment in time. We have a spiritual birth. And the only thing that can bring that forth that birth is Jesus forgiving us of our sin and putting the Holy Spirit inside of us who makes our dead spirit alive. Jesus didn't come to make good people better. He didn't come to put the cherry on top, okay, of good people. He came to make dead people alive. It's not original. That's why it's good. He came to make dead people alive. We're spiritually dead. We're spiritually inoperable. We're spiritually not connected to God. And there comes a point in time where, where we hear the gospel. And it says in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That context is the gospel. They have to hear the gospel. And again, again, it goes back to, and I know you hear me say this a lot, but I'm talking to me too when I say it. We have to preach the gospel. Who are we to withhold salvation? 
There's thieves all around us that are guilty. They're just not hanging on a cross. There, many of them are bound with sin, bound with guilt, having no hope, thinking that they deserve to die. They, they deserve that. Why should they even live? And the enemy is coming in with all these lies saying, boy, you're horrible. You're horrible. God would never accept you, never accept you. And he, and, he, and he wants us to come alongside, and we think we prejudge. I'm telling you, I do it too. You prejudge and think, oh, they're not going to they're not going to be interested. They won't listen to me. We we think somehow they have it all together. Some, somehow they're going to say re, they're going to reject the message as if that's the worst thing that can possibly happen to us in our lives. It's not the worst thing. Persecution is good for the believer. There's not really anything in Scripture that shows us that that's something to be avoided. Seriously. But, and, and that's why there's a lot of, unfortunate, in the American, in the Western church, there's a lot of make-believers. There's a lot of people that are not Christians that are going through the motions. They don't understand the gospel. Remember, Jesus said, as broad, the broad is the road that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to life, and very few find it. But somehow we think that everyone that believes in God, everyone that goes to church, everyone that acknowledges God, somehow they, they are all believers. And God says, no, they're not all believers at all. If someone doesn't even understand the gospel, do you think that they've received the gospel? No. How many people do you know that don't understand the gospel? That means they haven't appropriated the gospel. They haven't believed it if they don't understand it, but they have to hear it. We need to give them a chance. And, and Romans says, if we preach that gospel, then that will produce faith. That'll produce faith. But we have to be, he goes, who, why can't, they can't hear if they don't have a preacher. He talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. He doesn't say how beautiful are the feet of those who invite people to come to church to hear good news. The whole idea of feet is that you're going. The disciples didn't want to leave. The Christians didn't want to leave Jerusalem. So God had to send persecution through Saul for them to leave. And then they were scattered. It uses the word broadcast, like you scatter seed. That's who we are. We're seed that gets planted for a harvest. It made them take off. Jesus had already told them that we need to preach the gospel in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. It needs to go out from Jerusalem. It's a picture of the church. The church needs to go out. And, and that's God's heart. That's why Jesus had an appointment in Samaria in John chapter 4. Where he says he needed to go through Samaria. They went through an area they would never normally go through, except for the three major feasts. It was, they would actually go around. It would, take, it would add an extra time to their day but because their, the hatred for the Samaritans was so great. And Samaritans weren't, you know, you know, they had the same issues going on. They hated them. But, they, but Jesus needed to go to Samaria because he had an appointment with a woman at a well who was burdened down with guilt and no hope. So the Holy Spirit saying to us, be bold with the gospel, be bold with people and you can't earn it and they just need to hear the hope they need to hear the equivalent of seeing jesus suffer and seeing how gracious he is they need to hear that from us we need to share our story no one can argue with it it's a beautiful thing when god does a work of the holy spirit and i just i'm just so thankful for his great heart even demonstrated on the cross everybody saw it that needed to see it that day the crazy thing is is the thief that didn't repent he saw the same set of facts but he didn't mix it with faith. And he's, he's still suffering as a result of that. Sad. Let's preach the gospel. Lord, thank you for your word. We want to be faithful to you. We want to be light. We want to shine our lights, Lord. We want to preach that powerful gospel. We recognize it's, the, it's powerful. It's the power of God and the salvation. Help us to be bold. Pray as a church, we are such a bright light. We repent of holding back your truth. We repent. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be busy about your business and be salt and light. We pray, Father, that you would add workers to the harvest field in Half Moon Bay. We pray that you would add workers to the harvest field in El Granada and Montera and Moss Beach and all the places around, over the hill. We pray that you would add 
massive, massive amounts of workers into the harvest field. We pray for a massive harvest in the most unchurched area in America. We thank you that you're not limited by darkness. In fact, your light shines brighter the darker it is. Thank you for that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.